Now we go to the most important and most physical part of our video. You already know that Lagrange function is constructed of coordinates, velocities and time. But now the question is with regard to which reference system should we choose all of them. You might probably know that any measurement should be done with regard to some origin. For example, you see that I am staying in the room. This room is stationary with regard to Earth, but with regard to Sun it moves with some constant velocity because of orbital motion around Sun. Therefore, motion is relative, and the choice of origin totally determines the result. But where is better to choose the origin of coordinates to get a true description of our world? Well, usually people associate the origin of coordinates with some measure equipment. For example, with human who makes a measurement, detector, and so on. Let's suppose that I want to measure a distance from here to Paris. For that task, let this guy will be our origin of coordinates and therefore all the measurements will be done with regard to him. But in general, the choice of origin of coordinates depends on what you want to measure. You know that our space is homogeneous and isotropic, therefore physically it doesn't matter where to choose the origin of coordinates, because all the points of space are the same. To put some clarity, inertial reference frames appear in the game. Inertial reference frame is a coordinate system which moves with regard to other coordinate system with constant velocity. This notion is easy to understand. Look, let's choose this guy as our first coordinate system and he will be our origin of coordinates. Then let's take this green car as our second coordinate system and suppose that it moves with some velocity, say, 40 miles per hour. You see that it's constant velocity and this green car moves relative to our first guy with constant velocity. Therefore, we can say that our green car is inertial reference frame. Now, let's say that our red car moves with velocity, say, 50 miles per hour with regard to our guy. Then, this red car is also inertial reference frame with regard to this boy. We can introduce infinitely many inertial reference frames and measure a distance, for example, from cars to Paris. Say distance. R1, R2, and R3. Of course, these distance, distances will be different. But the main feature of inertial reference frame is that the laws of motion in every of them are the same. Please don't confuse measured distances, such as distance from the, from the car to Paris. Distances will be different, but the laws of motion, such as second Newton's law, are the same. Now, if you want to jump from one car, say our first car green, to the second car, you can use and measure distance not from green car to Paris, but from the red car to Paris. You can introduce famous Galilean transformation. R1 is a distance from the green car to Paris, and R2 is a distance from red car to Paris. Velocity v to 1 is relative velocity of the red car with regard to a green. Please notice that time in this approach remains unchanged. To sum up, the principle of Galilean invariance may be reformulated as invariance of physical laws under Galilean transformations. Finally, we have introduced all the unit mass stuff. Now let's see how the kinetic energy appears in physics. Consider motion of two free particles. And let's construct a Lagrange function for all of them. According to homogeneity of our space, Lagrange function can depend on radius vector r, nor on time t. The only dependent which remains is velocity. Next, because of isotropy of our space, Lagrange function can depend on direction of velocity, but can contain dependence only on the absolute value of it, say on the second, fourth, eighth power, etc. Now let's find out which power works for physics. To do it, let's recall famous Galilean transformations. We know that according to principle of Galilean invariance, in every system the laws of motion should be the same. Therefore, we should choose such Lagrange function which will generate for us similar equations of motion. What we are going to do now is to compare Lagrange function for different powers of velocity, for the second, fourth, and so on. If those Lagrange functions will be 
equal up to a constant or a full time derivative of coordinate function, the principle of Galilean invariance will be satisfied. If it's not true, such Lagrange function can never be physical. Now let's say that our second particle moves with very small constant velocity epsilon with regard to the first. From this formula we can easily derive the transformation for velocity. We can differentiate this first formula. So you see that it will be velocity 2 equals velocity 1 plus epsilon. First, let's consider the second power of velocity and do the Galilean transformations for such kind of Lagrange function. So let's write down that our second Lagrange function, say for the second particle, is the first Lagrange function and velocity v1 plus epsilon square because it's our v2 square. Let's rewrite this in the following way. It's v1 square plus 2 v1 epsilon plus epsilon square. As our velocity epsilon is very small velocity, so we can expand this expression in power of epsilon and neglect high order infinitesimals. So we get L1 of v1 square plus 2 dL1 over dv1 square multiplied by v1 epsilon plus so on. It is equal to L1 of v1 square plus again 2 dL1 over dv1 square epsilon and v1 we can rewrite as derivative of r1 function over time. You see that as our Lagrange function depends quadratically on velocity, this is simply a constant. Epsilon, our velocity, is constant by definition. And here we have full time derivative of coordinate function. According to our second property, we see that Lagrange function is invariant under such transformation. It means that in this case, such Lagrange function will generate similar equations of motion only after Galilean transformation. It means that Galilean principle in this case is satisfied and such power of velocity works for physics. So for physical system we got that our Lagrange function is proportional to the square of velocity and some constant c. You see that uh, the form of Lagrange function is very similar to form of kinetic energy and it not just a co coincidence. By the way, we can generalize our um, one free particle into the system of non-interactive free particles. For it, we can use our third property of additivity of Lagrange function. For the such big system of non-interactive particles, we will get such formula, where we have sum over all the particles. i goes from 1 to n, where n is number of particles. Uh, also, we can generalize our Lagrange function into a system of interactive particles. It turns out that we can add, to do it, we can add a function u, which depends on relative positions of every particle. The first term, which depends on velocities of, of each particle, is called kinetic energy. And the second term, which depends on relative positions, relative coordinates of every particle, is our potential energy. Now, let's find a physical sense from here. To do it, we can use other Lagrange equations. Let us uh, substitute this Lagrange function into it. So, if you do this, we have from the first term 2c, derivative of velocity over time. And the right part of the equation is derivative of u function over coordinate. You see that it's nothing but potential force F. This structure is very similar to the second Newton's law. Look, second Newton's law is mass multiplied by derivative of velocity and on the right hand side is also force. From here we can say that 
Our constant C is mass divided by 2. And kinetic energy is simply mass divided by 2 pointed by 2 squared. Now guys, I want to summarize all the main points being covered. The first. Lagrange function can be no higher than the second order in velocity because of requ requirement of homogeneity and isotropy of our world. The second. Constant mass divided by 2 appears in Lagrange function as well as kinetic energy as an arbitrary constant and can be fixed via the second Newton's law. The third. Our Lagrange function coincides with the energy of a system when potential energy U is zero. But in general, we can't associate the Lagrange function with the full energy of a system because of this additional term. And the last, if you have Lagrange function, you can easily get from it equations of motion by applying to earlier Lagrange equations. You can get equations of motions, solve them and obtain a trajectory. It's all for now, guys. Subscribe to our channel and see you in the next videos. Bye-bye!